Hi, I'm Rebecca Baccarelli, the Director of Alumni Relations at Juilliard, and it is my pleasure to welcome our wonderful alumni, trustees, donors, and friends to our Women in the Arts Roundtable. Leading our discussion tonight is Dan's alumna, Bonnie Oda Holmesy, um, and joining us on the panel are drama alumna, Brittany Bradford, flute and historical performance alumna, Emmy Ferguson, double bass and jazz alum, Andia Owens, voice alumna, Susanna Phillips, and the Richard Roger, Dean and Director of the Julia Drama Division, Evan Yadulis. We have a great conversation in store for tonight. So without further ado, I am going to hand it off to Bonnie to get deep into this conversation. Thank you so much, Rebecca, Steph, David, and your team and Juilliard for making today possible. And welcome, you lovely panelists, you. And I also shout out to some really, I'm looking at the chat, some distinguished, accomplished women joining us today. So please, we are relying on you to put your questions, your comments, perspectives into the chat. So ladies, Let's start off, since I don't really know you, tell me, are you, before the pandemic started, are you one of the glass half full or glass half empty persons? And second, can you share some of your secret sauce coping mechanism during the past year? Well, I've been really lucky that I've um, been hanging out a lot with my parents and they have these three wonderful dogs that have definitely been my coping mechanisms for this year in terms of keeping me, you know, positive each day, getting me going for a walk, um, all of that kind of wonderful stuff. So, and I, I would say most days glass, ha glass half full, but you know, each day presents a, a, a different picture. So some days it's, it's harder to get there than others. I feel like I'm just like the glass is half. <laughs> is that a fair <laughs> answer? Um, it just is half. Um, but yeah, I mean, coping, I was able to be home for uh, a while when I thought that this was only going to be, you know, three weeks or so. And so I got to go home for six months. And that was the longest that I've been with my family since I was in high school. And so that just being around them and being in nature in California was wonderful. And here, um, I'm fostering a dog who you might hear throughout this and he's actually given me a lot of like presence and peace of mind so that's been lovely as well yes i i usually feel just just like a regular glass <laughs> i don't know whether it's full or or empty who knows these days but ways that have been getting me through the quarantine and, and the pandemic is actually helping other people like I um, started an organization that gives out free meals and gives free music concerts to the community. And that's been one of the ways that I can create the change and change the narrative of people's lives. I tend to be a, a before the pandemic, I, was, I would certainly categorize myself as a glass half full kind of person. Um, and during the pandemic, I was surprised at how some, how negative feelings kind of came up. It was a really hard time, I think hard for a lot of artists and, um, and uh, kind of acknowledging those feelings and recognizing them and, and finding, you know, even when you have those feelings, finding ways to be positive. I, at home, we have four kids. And um, so it has been as disruptive, if not more for them than it has been for my husband and myself. So um, for me, you know, coping has been going for long walks and trying to look at the world through their eyes and, and find the little, the little joys, the, the, the silver linings. Yeah, I, I feel that, um... I've been blessed to have work and it's been a lot of work. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I felt that we were working very hard before, but now uh, in the drama division, um, it's, you know, exponential. And uh, so I guess, you know, the dedication of the rest of the faculty and the resilience of the students, uh, even in the face of what many are facing and continue to face um, 
has kept has kept me going. And uh, I I actually I'm I'm a mother I'm a mother too, and my grown children came and spent some time here, so that's been fantastic um, uh, for me as well. So, you know, it's so interesting because I, I don't know that I really paid attention to the, the term self-care before the pandemic. Uh, and it has become increasingly important in my life because I, I find myself giving out so much. So my battery reserves tend to run low. Has anyone felt that as well? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm trying to think. I mean, yes, I, for me, I was, I had just started working on uh, a pilot right as things were shutting down and we did about three days and then stopped and didn't pick up until November. And of course I had been, not of course, but I'd been doing theater throughout before. Then this was, you know, a transition period. So all of a sudden going from, you know, having work and being able to feel creative to really having no idea when it was going to pick up again and be in flux. It also changed some self-care habits, I think, because I realized some of those involved being around other people or going and seeing uh, other shows. And it was just this re-navigation process. Um, but I think that that is also what self-care is. It's figuring out what you need in that moment. I mean, what I needed first year of Juilliard is not what I needed fourth year. And it has to constantly evolve and change. So. Uh, Yes, but part of what the process is, I guess. Um, so, you know, we are all at different junctures of career. Uh, my my next question really has to do with at this projunction at this particular juncture of your career. What element do you find most critical? Is it funding? Is it capacity building? Is it networking? Is it mentors or something else? I think the most uh, the most critical thing right now is since we all have to record remotely, um, it's just finding the ways to make that an organic feeling because nothing compares to being on stage and being around people who are like minded and that and you just feed off the creativity all the time. How do you cultivate that from behind the camera? That's been that's been the thing that I've tried to work on and people that I work with on the Colbert show, we we try to make make it fun in ways, okay, we're gonna speed up the tempo right here, no click. <laughs> you know, so so that's that's one of the things, just finding that feeling again. The same feeling that you feel on stage when you're around people. How can you get that again? I think it's so oh go ahead, Susan. Oh by all means, I mean go for it. I was just going to say how I think for so many of us um, who started our crafts very, very young, um, we often don't have the opportunity to reflect on what drives us to be doing our craft still today and what is important for us because we've been doing it our whole lives and we've been so focused in that. And what has been really challenging for me this year is, is with projects that keep getting put on the books and then getting canceled, you know, a week or two weeks in advance, you kind of never really get prepared in a certain way because you're like, oh, it's going to cancel. You're always waiting for that letdown. Um, but it's deciding what motivates and inspires you yourself without any external forces has been really, really helpful for me to try and reframe um, when those moments of sort of disappointment happen um, when things don't come into fruition. Oh, I should never let you go before me. You said exactly what I wanted to say. Oh, no, it's just also, <laughs> there's also, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about the exact same thing where, where you sit there and reflect on why you're doing what you're doing. I mean, we all do very strange things. I mean, it, it's a, as, as far as a profession, when you think about what you're going to do when you're four, um, being an opera singer, is not always, you know, number one <laughs> for a lot of kids. And uh, it was, certainly wasn't for me. And it's a you know very specialized field. And um, to really consider if this is you know why I'm doing what I'm doing, and and to take it a, one step further, its impact on the world 
and how it has been presented so far. The innovations that are going on now out of necessity are fascinating. And I'm really interested to see what's going to remain and develop and what is going to fall by the wayside after we've gotten through this period. I'm interested to see what was happening before that's not going to return. And I'm really interested to see um, how all this creativity is going to keep going forward. But I, I think reflecting on the point, the, reflecting on your own voice, what you have to say, what you have to give, and um, how you want to do that in a, in a thoughtful way with everything going on in our world. Evan, you want to weigh in? I mean, I, I keep uh, thinking, you know, some uh, uh, every time any question is posed, I think in a sort of in a double way, you know, in terms of in whatever normal times mean. And then, you know, now now in COVID in COVID times and um, I think you know. For I'm I'm further along in my um, artistic journey than uh, than some of the other panelists here, and I, I think that you know what um, some people who are doing now uh, is something that um, I found that I've had to do it many times during my career in terms of reexamining what is what is it what is it that I know what sort of um, career track am I on versus what kind of um, personal development as an artist. Um, how do I keep making sure that I'm taking projects that scare me, uh, that I don't know how to do? Um, how do I uh, keep learning? Um, you know, how, how do I challenge myself um, in ways um, that, uh, that are not just about building a career, but about building an artistic life and an artistic process. And so um, this kind of cycle that I think um, COVID forced a kind of putting the brakes on and saying, what, you know, what do I want? What do I have to contribute to the world? Um, what have I not thought of? There actually, uh, there's some times that I've had to do that for myself or chosen to do that for myself, even when the rest of the world continued continued running so um i also feel yeah. like this oh sorry evan go ahead oh. i i feel like the, kind of echoing what evan is saying that i also feel like this time has been for me as an actor the time where i'm like well i'm not going to be working for however long has allowed me to really assess the past experiences that i've had in rehearsal spaces and really figure out like which collaborations uh, were fruitful and which were not, and which type of environment that I want to be in and what don't I? Because I think sometimes when you're starting off, it's like, yes, I'm gonna say yes to everything, but just come, come, come to me and I need work. And then when you actually get a second to take a breath, it's like, oh, wait a second, that's actually maybe not for me. And maybe that's not for me as well. And maybe you like trying to figure out what that path is. I think being able to have the time to do that and not have, you know, 10 auditions down the pike has been really helpful too. So, you know, environment is obviously very critical and let's sort of drill into that a little bit. How are each of you negotiating the balance between career and relationship and what that is allowing you to do in terms of taking risks and inquiry? and yet having a kind of emotional center or safe harbor for yourself. Um, if you have found a balance, is it a percentage? Is it flexible? Uh, and how have you dealt with saying no to an opportunity? Well, there's a lot in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's so hard for, for performers in um, figuring out that balance because when you're going out on stage, you're putting all of your vulnerabilities out there. And that's really, really scary. Um, and to, to show the things that maybe you aren't 
an expert in, but you're working on and what that's like and how that is, um, is super challenging and to receive the feedback from people that isn't always glowing <laughs> um, can feel like a direct hit on you as a person rather than on your craft or, and a lot of these, you know, statements that people will make are, are purely based on aesthetic subjective um, opinions that they have, but it's really hard to, to not let it affect your well-being, or at least I find it hard <laughs> to let it not affect my well-being um, because it does feel so personal because what we do is like the core of who we are. I, 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 I have no, no children, no, no lover, so <laughs> I um, have more time maybe than others, but at the same time, relationships are very, very important to me. I mean, I think that's part of the reason of, of being alive is the relationships you make with other people. And in that way, the artistic relationships that we forge, I think uh, is part of being alive. And for me, the process is just as important as the product. So it's just as important to me who I'm meeting in a rehearsal space and how those people are speaking about the work and speaking about what it is to be human and how they care about diversity and inclusivity just as it's just as important as whatever thing we're coming up with at the end of the day because if it's treacherous to do everything leading up to the actual performance to me personally that's that's not worth it it's not at all and so being able to really find those people and latch on tightly has been uh, my version of relationship building within this sorry i can't see all of you go ahead Right. One thing that has kept me grounded is actually thinking about my family and the people who I started playing bass all for. Myself and the community around me, that's how I started music. But honestly, it's been so difficult. That's been the most difficult part, not seeing everyone, not seeing those inspirations, not being reminded of your inner child or things that just give you so much of a, of a relief when you need a break, when you're almost burned out. You know, to be disconnected from that is a lot. But then, you know, the question is, okay, how, how can you do it in a different way? If there's no way to do it the normal way, think about other ways to do it. That's, that's been my balance. Okay, this is not an entrance. Okay, let's, let's find the back door. <laughs> let's, let's think of ways to create your own, to create your own own ideas and your own creations, thinking out of the box, like just FaceTiming. I've never FaceTimed so much in my life <laughs> until this pandemic. So, so those are those are a few, a few of the things. Um, I I totally agree with with you, India. I think it's. Um, just so this is an exciting time to see how everybody's being so creative in the way they're thinking and what they're trying. I think for me, you know, at the beginning of the of my career, I kind of said yes to a lot of stuff and I just just to get the career my career started. And then it just kind of rolled. And this has been a wonderful opportunity to kind of take a minute and you know, really think a long and hard about the, how I want to make those choices. I, I do have a family at home and I, um, I do want to be a present parent and um, that, you know, balancing that is hard. There, there is no right way to do it. Um, and there are a lot of wrong ways to do it. <laughs> so I think um, it, with, with each job, I um, weigh how it will make me feel as a musician and as a person. And if that feels good and uh, it, it also, you know, will help. Um, I find that I'm a better parent when I am a musician too. If I fill my cup over here, it helps uh, with the pouring of the cup over there. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I, th I think that's, um, but I am, I am quite a bit more discerning now about, about what I, what I choose to, to, to leave my family to do. So, uh, you know, this is an interesting juncture where uh, President Biden has just created this new gender policy council. And I was reading today in the LA Times a headline 
that women historically are 60% of Nevada's legislature. But yet, on the other hand, last year, Dance Data Project came out with um, a study that basically said of our top 50 dance companies, they're run by a significant number of men in artistic director and executive director positions. Yet, that statistic is flipped with small budget companies, with women now stepping up and being, you know, taking on the leadership roles. So my question to you is how have you now been able to navigate equity and um, a diversity in your fields? And can you share a win moment? Well, it, as a, I'm so sorry, Brittany, didn't want to interrupt. No, no, you go, go. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have a, maybe a slightly unique perspective because um, I've, I've been a solo singer for my career, but I've also been a co-founder of a chamber music festival. So I've kind of seen both sides of the coin. Emmy's played at the festival and it's amazing. And she, it's, it's hilarious. It's a it's lot incredible. about the t-shirts, but it's really a fun week of great people getting together and just making music and having a wonderful time and eating a lot of Southern food. And, um, it's interesting, you know, we, we happened to plan a strategic plan planning session in March of 2020, which um, I don't know if y'all heard, there was a lot going on then and for the couple months following. And um, it it opened the door for a lot of conversations about having a chamber music festival in the South um, of classical music with everything that's going on in our country and around the world. And, um, you know, I, I was very happy in our strategic planning and looking back at our audience development and the you know musicians we hired and the the composers we hired and the the people who were part of the festival were were very racially diverse and I was I was proud of that but it did make us really consider um, how we wanted how we wanted to be as an organization if we wanted to be an organization that um, spoke up about it and talked about inclusivity and on, a, on and, and used our platform to do that or not and um, we decided we would want to, wanted to do that. And so we've uh, tried and figured out ways to do that. But to me personally, that was kind of a win for, um, I, was, I was proud of that, our little tiny organization being one of the first people to come out and really talk about it um, with our peers. And I was glad about that. I've been thinking about this a lot because the last two shows that I did before everything shut down were two shows that were directed by women with the cast of all women. And they were without a doubt the most challenging and also the most rewarding artistic experiences that I've ever had, period. And I was trying to think, okay, well, why, why, what was it, what was it that was in those spaces that made it feel that way? And I think there was an absolute buy-in from every single person. And there was an acceptance and a safety that was made by those women and particularly the directors, women of color that I've gotten a chance to work with throughout my career who said, you know, we're going to bring everybody here, everybody to the table. You don't, there's no judgment that is being made on you. There's no value judgment. You don't have to like soft shoe around something or second guess what you're about to say. I'm accepting you fully and we want your artistry to come to the table. And those rooms ended up being everybody taking incredible risks and just really putting themselves out there and not scared to fail. And I will say that all of the other experiences that I had when I was working with men and they were all white men and I am gonna make a, I'm saying that because I think intersectionality is important to you know talk about how those worlds come together. Um, and I know I'm making a general statement, but they just, it wasn't the same. It, it felt like there was a, um, a safety in the in the negative sense of just everyone kind of playing it safe and everyone kind of being polite and not really going for it. And I don't know what that was about. I don't know if it was people feeling safe in their jobs or if it was people not wanting to, you know, uh, have those difficult conversations with, you know, the one person of color that was in the space or whatever. But I, there was a big gap. And I, I look at across the board, every single one of those shows, had a uh, a man, a white man as the artistic director. Every single one, no matter who was the the director, 
And it just made me think, well, what could it be if it was flipped? You know, what would it be if there were more women in leadership positions? Would it have that sense of risk and that sense of, you know, valuing different perspectives like I felt when I was in the rehearsal room? And I just feel like I want to, we don't know. <laughs> and I want to see because I've seen some of those differences on a smaller scale. But then at the same time, sometimes I feel like we as in, in theater, at least kind of pat ourselves on the back because we put diversity on the stage and we put diversity in the, in the crew and, and it doesn't go up, you know, there is a ceiling. And uh, I'm curious if that will change when we come back to everything. Evan, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, I think Andea had a an impulse there. Did you did you want to follow <laughs> on? And then I and then I can. Okay, sure. Um, I had I had two big wins uh, during the pandemic. The first one was being able to hire musicians, like local musicians around the, the New York area, and giving people free concerts. And the thing about that, it's not just creating an all-female band or an all-female organization, but it's actually showing people that there's an equal level of skill. Like whether you're on stage with a whole group of women or men, you know, we should be respected and our work should really speak for itself. At, at one point, I would hope that we can get past Oh, she's a female artist. Oh, like she's an artist. She's phenomenal. She she's amazing. She does what she does. So that's been one of the major wins for me, just showing that inclusivity, just showing that everyone is doing their job and they're great at it. Um, the second big win was actually a commission that I took to write for the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra. And at first I was like, wow, this is um, it's a pandemic. I can't hear what this is going to sound like, but okay, I'll do it. And I got a chance to write about someone who I feel like doesn't get enough credit, Ida B. Wells. And just to tell her story through music and to write their names in the books and, and to keep it going, I feel like that that's so powerful. We have to be the teachers. We have to be the people that continue this legacy, and that's that's how you do it with your with your work, writing their names, telling people about it. I, I was in response to what Brittany was talking about. I mean, I think there will, I think there is being uh, a movement for change, and I think it will. I think there's been an accelerant um, in the past year. Um, in the theater world, and I think that there's a lot of commitment to make changes. I, um, when I was a young director, I remember going into the uh, in tech. I would go out to the ladies' room, and the ladies' room would be empty because there would be nobody working on that side of the footlights who needed to use the ladies' room. Um, and uh, that's that's changed over the course of of my of my career. Um, I do think there's there's a big point, Bonnie, in what you were saying about smaller companies. I mean, I think it's I know um, many women and um, and BIPOC uh, women and and men who've gotten theaters uh, right at this time, at the moment of crisis, at the most difficult time financially, at the most difficult um, time, and uh, it's. Um, you know, I know people who just got a theater that then was shut down. And uh, I think that that's, um, I don't know what kind of cosmic, some, you know, phenomenon that that is. But I, I think that, um, you know, I, I think that we're all knowing how valuable the arts is and how we all have to work together to keep it alive, to keep it going after after this this period and um to make sure that uh that there's community support and government support for um you know keeping artists alive uh we you know people are creating things for free and putting it on the internet but in terms of keeping body and soul together um those those kind of things we need to you know step up as a country to make sure that that 
that happens, especially now when people who haven't had voices for so long are beginning to have opportunities. And I think we need to keep the pressure on as well, though, you know, because I'm still certainly in the in the organizations that I work in, the artistic leadership is largely male and largely white men. And that's incredibly frustrating. It was frustrating a year ago. It was frustrating five years ago. Um, but is there now um, a microphone that we can continue to amplify and push and really demand change from these organizations that need to um, bring in all these voices that you know are part of the discussion and need to be heard? Yes, absolutely. We must keep the pressure on. So um, we're going to be segueing fairly soon to our Q&A. So, um, Listen, as a last question, what advice would you give your younger self? I would say two, two, two pieces of advice. Um, the first would be to find how to be as present as possible. And uh, for me, that was like a big journey leaving school is finding places to, you know, you really work this muscle of being critical and trying to figure things out and learn and all of that, but really settling in silence and really practicing like mindfulness and meditation and realizing the temporariness of all of this makes the highs not feel so high because they will eventually go away and the lows not feel so low because they will eventually go away. And just having to work on just being in this moment and then in this moment and then in this moment, I think has helped has just helped me feel better <laughs> and have more gratitude and be kinder to both myself and those that I, I love and, and support those around me. Um, and then the other thing I think is just trying to find your community, like really trying to find the people who at the core have the same type of mission statement as you and, and will push, you will push each other to be better. For me, it was um, being able to be a part of this collective called Classics, which is all about navigating and exploring theater history and centering the perspective of black playwrights and black plays and having an educational component and, and all of this. And I've always felt, especially through this quarantine and pandemic is no matter what has happened with theater, whatever will happen with theater, I have this other thing on the side that is generative and we are constantly creating. And I don't worry about when will the next job come or worrying about if someone's going to hire me because I know that I can create work for myself and then I'm surrounded by people who will do the same. So I think finding that community is 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 advice that I would give myself, like do it as soon as possible. You'll love it. For me, what I would tell my younger self is to be more intentional with the way that I take up space in this world as a woman and especially as a black woman, because there are young girls watching you. Like they're, they're wanting to be like you, they're following in your footsteps. Like, what does that mean? How can I take up space? When did I not speak up for myself or someone else? When did I have a question <laughs> that, that I really wanted the answer to, but I chose to be quiet? When did I not take a risk for something that I know I could have been exceptional at. That's, those, are, those are the two things, taking risks and taking up space. Now I do that. <laughs> I think asking for help. Um, I think I'll, I certainly feel that there were moments where I would try to do everything myself and figure it out without asking for that extra help that, that, that would have allowed me to be more present and take those risks, you know, like India and Brittany were talking about. Yeah, I think, you know, for, for me, I'd probably just, I'd probably jump on that bandwagon, talk about taking risks and, and, as far, and also talk about trying, trying lots of different kinds of things, trying lots of different ways to be an artist and, and be a singer, be an actor, be a musician, be an artist, like, try all these different kinds of things. I mean, 
um, it's been it's been fascinating to to feel the release of that and especially in this time where you really can just experiment and see what's going on and and um i i, I do think I, I i would give that advice to my my younger self yeah i would tell myself um but i think something um Or maybe I'm at a point where there are things that I think that I did that um, may not have been smart career moves, but that actually led me to what it is I was meant to do in some sorts of ways. Um, and um, but I think that I would tell uh, I do try to tell uh, younger artists that to, to take heart that there's no one path and that there's no way to do it right. And that you have to try to follow your heart, follow your passion, try to give back the way you can give back. And if you do that, you're gonna be okay. And that when people actually do see the work that you've done, they'll see work that you cared about. They'll see a story that you wanted to tell that you felt was important for the world to hear. And if that leads to another job or if it doesn't, that's not something that you can control and that you couldn't have picked something else that you can only um, try, to, try to be be true to something at any, at any particular time. So, um, and I think, I guess I would have told my younger self that because it would have stopped me from worrying about so many choices that I made or didn't make, um, but um, that's sort of where I am now. Yeah, just uh, piggyback on what you just said, Evan, you know, for me, it would be telling my younger self not to be afraid to be my authentic self and not to try to please others, but really to look deeply inside of who I am. And second of all, to understand the difference between having a mentor and having an advocate. You know, a mentor shares knowledge and expertise so that you are able to navigate that journey, but an advocate is somebody who recommends you for a job or who supports and promotes you in some way to advance the career in a different way. And I, I never understood that when I was younger. So, Thank you. Um, we're going to go to our Q and A. So let's see what our first question is. Um, so our first question, actually, and Dia, the question is: Jazz seems to be more male dominated than other areas. Have you handled this imbalance in your professional career? Yes. Well, there's a newsflash: most industries are male dominated. <laughs> But uh, what I did, I, I felt over a period of time earlier in my career that my voice wasn't really being heard. I felt like I wasn't being respected in some spaces. So one thing that I did was find the people who did respect me, who were my advocates, like you say, you know, that's very important. People who will root for you, people who will teach you and show you what you're doing wrong, what you're doing right, they'll be with you every step of the way. And honestly, that increases my own artistry. I'm able to focus more. I'm not thinking, oh, okay, what, what did they just say that wasn't okay? I'm just thinking about the music. And another crucial thing that I did, I just started my own band. I said, okay, um, I'm just gonna do my own thing and it's gonna be killing musicians and everyone that I respect and everyone who respects me. And I'm gonna tell all these stories through my art. So that's what I did. Thank you. So do we have a, another question popped up? Okay, so this is for everybody. During a lean time or during a career transition, doing nine to five work, how do you keep energy and dedication for your art alive? Oh, 
I'll jump in on this one. This has been a very interesting time um, because this is certainly a long, lean period for a lot of working artists. Um, and I think one of the things um, that we talked a little bit about earlier about self-care, I think uh, allowing the days where you're not feeling inspired to be okay, allowing you know a day or two to go by where you just, you know, I don't, I don't want to practice today. I'm, I'm down. I don't want to do it. And then on the days that you are inspired, letting yourself go there and letting yourself really, you know, try new and different things. I think that um, I. I Personally, I, I practice. Uh, I've been I've been practicing more in the last year than I had before because I have a lot of time. But I also loved not having something specific to practice for. I loved going back and you know go, going back to some exercises that I hadn't worked on or learning new music that I hadn't done. I've been studying jazz this whole time by happened like by some randomly this is not <laughs> um it's not uh, i happen to be potted up with a jazz guitarist who's teaching me wonderful things about jazz and um it's just been a fascinating time to try and be flexible and, and try new things and keep keep that keep that nervousness the thing that make that scares you you know like you were talking earlier evan about you know try and take on things that that aren't um things you necessarily thought you would try. And I, I think keeping that alive has been an interesting thing to explore in this time. But I do think kindness about, you know, the days where it just doesn't work or the days where you're just not, you're not feeling it. And and I think and allowing that to be okay sometimes. Not every day, but sometimes. Anyone else want to jump in? I would just say one one thing that helped me when I was um, was to like skip, you know, if you have a nine to five, but to and if you have any period of time to schedule that for yourself, to schedule that for yourself as an artist to say uh, Saturday from two to four, I, you know, when the world returns, but I'll go to a museum or I'll read this book or I'll uh, you know, or I'll, I'll screen this film and read something about it or something that can be, and, and if anybody calls me to do anything else during that time, I'm gonna say I'm booked in the same way that I would say I was booked in any, in any other way. And um, really, really saying that, that you deserve that. No one else? Okay, let's go to the next question. So what tangible recommendations of allyship for women would you give to the man tuning in tonight? Uh, hire us. Hire women. <laughs> hire women and advocate for women and stand up for women. It's not that hard. I mean, if, if you see somebody, anybody, being treated badly or being dismissed or being spoken to in a rude way or not spoken to at all, advocate for them. And if I could echo that, in the room, in the time it's happening would also be helpful. I There were times where, and you know, sometimes it's, that's not always possible, but for the most part it is. And I there would be times where I'd be in situations where I was like, wow, I feel like, I don't know, I felt like I was disrespected at that point, but I, I'm the only woman in this space where I'm the only black person in this space and I'm having a lot of difficulty figuring this out right now. And then someone would pull me aside outside and be like, wow, that wasn't okay the way that that person spoke to you. And I'm like, would have loved it if you could have said something in the space, you know, and then would have facilitated a conversation or we could have all grown together. But saying it to me after the person who it's happened to isn't as important as saying it into the room to the people that are, you know, directly involved. And listen. You know, give the space for your, you know, your female identifying colleagues to speak and listen to what they have to say. Yeah. And also hire, I'm sorry. And also hire us because you really respect our craft, not because it's a gimmick to you. You know, don't don't call and say we need a woman for this. No, you need an artist that's great to make your vision happen. That's that's the one thing. 
Don't treat us like a gimmick. We're not a prop. We're human beings. We've been doing this our whole lives. Nobody wants to be a token. No. There are so many, but there are so many opportunities where, you know, you're hiring a person and maybe the first person that comes to mind is a man. Great. Is there a woman that is, you know, also very, very talented who would also do a great job? Maybe you haven't hired a woman in a while. Maybe it'd be a great idea to do that. And you also want to uh, you know, magnify another voice, a different kind of voice that's different from what you've done before. Go women. <laughs> um, so we're almost at the tail end of today. And I just wanted to thank all of you who joined us today. As a gift from our panelists, Rebecca is going to be making available a resource document that we thought might be helpful just, you know, with some entities that may have been mentioned today. So again, that document is going to be available to all the attendees. And, you know, on a personal note, my theme for this discussion was lifting up women. And it's something that has always been important to me. So if you've been inspired or, or energized by today, I hope that you will make a pledge to do an act or action lifting up other women. You know, it, um, it's, we, we all need to feel and occupy and take space and have confidence to do what needs to be done at the moment. And I think that this is a unique time to really maximize that uh, act or action. Um, you know, and it can be anything, whether it's mentoring an emerging artist or advocating for a colleague, or perhaps financially supporting um, a scholarship or um, an entity like Juilliard, you know, with, with particular uh, fundings for women in the arts. I think that the power is in our hands. It's certainly in our talent um, and it highlights also the general generational contributions of women who came before us uh, in the arts. So at this point, I'd like to thank you all and turn it back to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Bonnie. And thank you to all of our panelists, um, Evan, Emmy, Susanna, Brittany, and Dia. You're all so inspiring. And this was really great thought provoking conversation. Um, we, we all really enjoyed it. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight and hearing our conversation, Women in the Arts. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to, we will see you at our next virtual event. Until then, stay safe and stay well. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.